My name is Marek Wencowski. I am from the Faculty of uh, History, University of Warsaw. And my short introductory lecture today will be about the time of the ancient Greeks. Ancient Greeks viewed man and woman's position, place in time very differently from the way we do. When we think of the passage of time, we usually say that something has happened, so we have already left it behind us. What had not yet happened is still in front of us, literally, so before us, before our eyes. This is the way we imagine uh, time as a path along which we constantly travel moving forward. Uh, the Greeks thought of time in a quite different manner. They said of the past events that they were in front of them uh, and of future events that they were still behind them. This is, in turn, a representation of, uh, of the human experience of life. Something has already happened, we have come to know it, we have seen it, and it is still standing before our eyes, consequently. It is therefore in front of us. Future things are hidden from us by the gods. They are, therefore, still behind us, invisible, inaccessible to our sight. We cannot see them, uh, and often cannot even imagine them properly. People thinking in this very way understood the whole world and their role within it in a very specific way. For them, there is no room for the bold, hopeful glimpse of the future. The future, uh, for the belief that the future can be predicted and planned, the future can only be illuminated for a moment by oracles or signs from a deity. The gods, however, by their very nature, send us signals that are unclear or even deliberately ambiguous and misleading. As in the famous story by the legendary wealthy Croesus, uh, king of the Lydians in Asia Minor, who heard from Apollo at Delphi that if he, had, if he started a war, he would destroy a great kingdom. Reassured of his plans, Croesus attacked the Persian Empire, and in doing so, he indeed destroyed a great kingdom, his own. Only defeated by the Persian ruler Cyrus, he asked the Delphic god why he had deceived him. The oracle was to reply that the god had helped him in a great deal anyway, postponing for as long as possible, the defeat that Croesus was destined to suffer in any case. For by the verdict of fate, which the Greeks called Moira, he had to suffer punishment for the transgressions of his distant ancestor, the founder of his dynasty, and the usurper of royal power, the assassin of the rightful king many generations before. The story is told by Herodotus, the Greek historian of the Persian Wars. Now, ordinary Greeks, too, believed that the dangers lurking in the future had their roots in the past, as announced to us as the future. The notion of ancestral guilt, which we unconsciously inherit from our forefathers, and naturally demand punishment from the gods. This was one of the important Greek commonplaces. Think, for example, of the king of King Oedipus in Greek tragedy. Although Oedipus himself offended the gods with his sinful pride, called hubris by the Greeks, uh, he owed his tragic fate, his patricide, and his marriage to his own mother primarily to the ancestral crime of his father, Laios, the first pedophile of Greek mythology. Laios allegedly raped his friend's son while he was staying with him as a guest. From this perspective, it can be said that in the eyes of the Greeks, there are no innocent people. There are only those 
who do not know yet about their hereditary sins, and so about the impending doom. Today we still remember that there used to be no internet. So getting information or contacting other people at a distance required much effort and above all time and patience. We can even imagine a world without electricity. Just across the eastern border of Europe, many Ukrainians must live without electricity due to Russian criminal aggression. Thus, it is easy for us to think of times without a fridge and the possibility of storing food. But to try to understand the ancient Greeks, we need to stretch our imagination even further. Let us think of a world without two obvious inventions which we cannot imagine even in the most miserable, uh, without which we cannot imagine even the most miserable human experience in existence. A world without timekeeping tools available to all, and without the artificial light that is ubiquitous nowadays after dark in human settlements of all kind. True, the Greeks knew both sundials and the uh, our glasses, but the former only worked on a sunny day, and the latter allowed only short periods to be counted. They were used, for instance, in the Athenian tribunals, so that parties in court cases knew how much time they had to speak. Meanwhile, without a watch or clock, we lived our daily lives, meeting friends around noon, at dawn or towards evening with no precision possible for coordinating our actions. Without the artificial light of lanterns, brightly lit houses, shop windows, all our activities must be confined to daylight hours. They were longer or shorter because the Greeks and Romans divided the day and the night separately into 12 hours, which were unequal depending on the season. But after dark, it was simply dangerous to move around at night. Bandits, thieves, uh, and even deeper holes uh, in the street threatened people constantly. Wealthy people could be known by the fact, among other things, that they were not afraid of the night because they had servants who could light their way in the dark. The Greek time was also different from ours in another fundamental respect. The aggressive Roman Empire, Roman Republic, had uh, overrun the entire Mediterranean and its continental hinterland, and it imposed its organization of time on the subjects of their empire and then on their successors, and ultimately on us and the entire modern world. They gave their names to the months and even to some of the days of the week to many Germanic and Romance languages. Our English July is German Juli or French Juillet, which is simply Latin Julius, the month of Julius, that is, of Gaius Julius Caesar. On the other hand, our Monday is German Montag and French Lundi, the late Roman Bay of the Moon in Latin Luna. In addition, it was the Romans who, through their organization of the year, according to the annual term of office of their highest officials, the two consuls, passed on to us the idea, otherwise completely absurd and meaningless and abstract, that each year should begin on the 1st of January. The Greeks, meanwhile, living not in one but in many hundreds of separate communities we call poles or city-states, function in a time devoid of any unity because each of their political communities has its own names for the months, its own calendar. Months were usually named after the main, the most important festivals. Falling in them, for instance, in the Athenian months of, month of Antesterion, uh, was the time when the great religious uh, festival of Antesteria was held, combining elements of uh, uh, of a feast of, of uh, new wine with that of uh, the dead. 
However, different Greek poles or cities uh, celebrated different festivals. Consequently, quite a few of the names of the months were purely local, and many were named differently in Athens, in her neighboring Megara, in Corinth or Sparta. Worse still, this time, like the Romans, the Greeks defined their years not by ordinal numbers, as we do, but by the, by the names of their highest officials. In Rome, these were the consuls. Something happened, for example, in the year when Caesar and Bibulus were consuls. That is, in our year uh, 59 BCE. In Athens, the year was named after the chief Archon. So, something happened, for instance, in the year of Isagoras. In Sparta, a similar function was performed by the most important official from the College of Ephesus. The Christian, Jewish, or Muslim system of eras conventionally counted from the birth of Christ, from the uh, creation of the world, or from the Hijra, Muhammad's flight from Mecca, would only organize time uh, into a li linear, coherent, and countable whole many centuries later. Interestingly, to emphasize their classical heritage, until recently, the French would inscribe their official buildings with inscriptions dating to the following years, for instance, where, when X was president of the Republic. Imagine a world like this, where a Greek merchant from Athens had to conclude a trade agreement with his partner from neighboring Megara or from distant Olbia in today's Ukraine, uh, near Crimea. They should not only date their joint venture according to the year named after the respective officials in their cities, two different cities, but also coordinate the names of the months and even the days used in their homelands. The Athenians and Spartans wishing to conclude an armistice would do the same. The famous Peace of Nikias during the Peloponnesian War in our March 421 BCE was concluded, quote, under the effort of Pleistolas in Sparta on the fourth day of the last decade of the month Artemisios and in Athens under the Archon Alcaios on the sixth day of the last decade of the month Elaphebolion. This is the way how they had to coordinate their respective time systems because of the differences I just mentioned. The Greeks lived in just such a world where time was inaccurate and conventional, inconsistent, partial and incompatible even between immediate neighbors and most people had to hide their homes after, in their homes after dark. Their experience of time, distance, sense of security and ability to coordinate activities differed significantly from ours. And it was under these conditions that they created the civilization from which we still draw today. To me, one of the most annoying ways of talking and writing about antiquity is to refer to it, uh, to it with a phrase like already the ancient Greeks and Romans did, knew, invented this or that. In this manner, we try to bring antiquity closer to our experience, but instead we fall into a cliché. The antiquity that our program is about is a world of people like us, people from whom we can learn a lot, but whose world, ideas or systems of values were utterly different from ours, sometimes even shockingly different from us and for us. Just think of slavery as its underlying social, economic and moral reality. In situations occasionally close to our personal experiences, such as politics, private life, entertainment, they behaved very differently from us. Some of them transformed their experiences into profound reflections on human beings and their place in the world, which we find in Homer, in Attic tragedy, uh, in Greek philosophers and Greek historians. Now, the great mystery of our relationship with the Greeks is precisely that people who were so different from us, who thought so differently from us, and are somehow still interesting to us, 
continue to inspire and make us think. To deal with the paradox of the simultaneous proximity and strangeness of the Greek antiquity, uh, we need to study the Greeks in their natural habitat, while at the same time studying them from a distance. In this way, we shall see the Greeks simultaneously in front of us and behind us in Greek and the modern sense of these words. Thank you for your attention.